Tapi nanti baru ke Fauziah Binti Raja Raja Tun Muda Datuk-datuk Para Profesor Ketua-ketua pengarah Kementerian uh, Jabatan Pengarah-pengarah Ketua-ketua uh, Jabatan Rakan-rakan akademik, rakan media uh, Tonton dan perempuan yang Terhormati sekalian uh, Saya bagi pihak Atumah UKM Mengalukan kehadiran uh, Mr. Dr. Encik John Ang eh, yang sudi menjadi pembicara dalam bicaraan umum Atma pada hari ini dan Atma merupakan pusat penyelidikan yang menawarkan pengajian ya, sarjana, masters dan juga doktor falsafah PhD dan kita di Atma kita tidak menawarkan pengajian prasiswa lah jadi kita hanya mengajar, hanya menawarkan program sarjana dan juga program uh, doktor falsafah yang terdiri daripada pelajar-pelajar daripada dalam dan luar negara uh, khususnya yang paling dekat ialah daripada Indonesia ya, dan juga Thailand Baik, uh, syarat umum ini diadakan uh, uh, setahun dua kali dan kita merasa betul uh, kita dapat Uh, mengadakan kali ini kali kedua yang mana yang pertama ialah uh, disampaikan oleh uh, yang berhormat menteri uh, uh, Puan Duraidah ya, uh, pada 2-3 bulan yang lepas baik um, jadi bagi pihak Atma kita mengucapkan terima kasih kepada semua yang dapat hadir pada hari ini um, dan kita mengharapkan kita dapat uh, mengambil manfaat daripada syarat umum yang akan disampaikan oleh uh, John, uh, please allow me to speak in English for benefit of our foreign uh, participant uh, from Singapore as well as from other parts of the world. Yeah? Okay, now our guest speaker, Mr. John Ang, a distinguished guest uh, speaker today, um, and also ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your presence uh, to this event, and um, I would uh, I would say uh, I would like to express my gratitude to Dato Associate Professor Dato Sama Mansur, the lady sitting at the back there, who made it possible for this event to take place. Uh, she was the one who uh, introduced uh, Mr. John to Atma, and we thought about you know having a public lecture so that we can um, gain some uh, inside understanding of the Batik collection of. Uh, Mr. John. Uh, let me read a bit of uh, his background. John, of Singaporean parent, was born in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, later, he returned to Singapore and grew up um, in Singapore and accomplished his A-level education and then completed his military service before returning to the state. Uh, in the U.S., uh, John completed Bachelor of Arts and also Master of Arts in the history of Asian Arts. And then during his study, he worked as an intern at the Detroit Institute of Arts and completed writing a handbook uh, on Asian arts for the visual person. This is the level of master's degree eh? after that, after that, yeah, right. Uh, from 1985 to 1987, John worked as an art journalist for the Japan Times in Tokyo before he moved to Taiwan to establish an art gallery um, at Taisa. Right. Art Asia, Art Asia, Fine Art Asian Art and Art Consultancy, yes. And then as the director of Art Asia, John helped over at 80 exhibition. I repeat, 80 exhibition on Asian art in prestigious venues in Taipei, Hong Kong, and also Bangkok. He also wrote many articles on Asian art, which have been published in notable magazines in Asia and in the United States. John has also traveled to China, US, South Asia to deliver lectures on Chinese art and furniture. That's another dimension that he also has. Uh, in 2013, John discovered Malay textiles and has been passionately been collecting them. Believe me or not, he has now over 4,000 pieces and has given lectures on his collection in Malaysia, Singapore, and Netherlands. So we are lucky to have him here and we will witness some of his collection outside. Later on, perhaps after the event, we'll have um, 
uh, uh, yeah, briefing and whatnot outside, you know, about the collection as well. Okay, from March to August 2019, this year alone, John, John organized a comprehensive and successful exhibition and seminar on Malay Kalingkang embroidery um, at the Trangano State Museum. Those who have been uh, there, uh, perhaps, um, should uh, recall all the interesting uh, and, and beautiful collection of, him, of his uh, items, you know, at the museum. In 2018, John decided to devote his life to the research and collective of Malay textile and moved to Kuala Lumpur to facilitate this mission. He hopes to write uh, a book on textile in the Malay world and find a good museum in Malaysia to house and show his collection for benefit of all. So perhaps this exhibition of small collection is a start uh, at UKM and perhaps we can negotiate more for a bigger exhibition later on. And um, this is about uh, John and some of you who are friends of John. Uh, thank you for coming here for your support and for the, for the rest also. Thank you for coming for your uh, interest uh, to listen to John's uh, speech. So please welcome Mr. John Ang. We view many things about uh, the Malay world which I had not known before. So I'd like to share these discoveries. Um, so let's go to the first slide. Textiles of the Malay world and batiks of the Malay world. Before we go into that, we have to understand who are the Malays. Um, we know um, in, uh, uh, in the middle of the century, um, there was Peter Dalwood who postulated the theory of the Malay uh, people coming from the Austronesian group of people from Taiwan. Uh, since then, it has been disputed, and Oppenheimer has uh, a new theory about the Malays coming from Southeast Asia from a big man land mass that was divided by flooding. So before, Borneo and the Malay Peninsula uh, and Sumatra was all one land mass, and after flooding, it separated the people. Uh, but they were all interconnected. So they came from the Austronesian uh, group of people and later um, moved up to the coastlands and developed their own culture, uh, stemming from the Hindu Buddhist culture and later developed into uh, Malay Muslim culture. So the Malay world um, is uh, actually a controversial topic uh, in terms of its periphery. Uh, what are the countries involved in the Malay world. Um, when uh, I grew up in Singapore, I studied under the British system in Singapore. And to me, the Malay world was Malaysia. And I think that was the purpose of the education then. Uh, when the British and the Dutch uh, separated uh, Malaysia and Indonesia in the Anglo-Dutch uh, Treaty in 1824, um, they were um, it was pertinent that they promoted a Malay culture stemming from the 15th century uh, development of Malacca. And this went well with the Malay royalty in the Malay Peninsula, so that most people forgot their roots, the Malay roots stemming from the Sri Vijaya Empire and the Malayu Kingdom of Jambi, Sri Vijaya of Palembang. These were the earlier Malay civilizations. And so most people um, uh, believe their culture starting, uh, started from uh, Malacca. Um, later, uh, it's only recently uh, when Malaysia and Singapore after being nationalized and the economy and political system being more stable that uh, historians are delving into the earlier history. So there's a recent book in Singapore, 700 Years of Singapore, uh, talking, uh, having references from uh, much uh, earlier sources than the British sources, talking about the Malay world that incorporates Sumatra and Jambi, uh, even Aceh. Um, yes, Aceh, how is that related to the Malay world? We remember Raja Bongsu, how he was uh, captured by the Achenese and he married. They were so into connecting with the Malay world that they uh, convince him to marry um, uh, the daughter of the Sultan. So a lot of the connections came from intermarriage. 
um, as you can see um, here, uh, Aceh is up here. So the north of Sumatra belongs to the Malay world. And then later, uh, we, we, we realized here I have Cambodia uh, and Vietnam, South Vietnam, connected to the Malay world. And this is because of the Cham Malays. Um, the study of the Cham civilization did not start until the late 19th century uh, by the French. Because after they conquered Vietnam, or they occupied Vietnam, they realized that the uh, Dai Vets, the Vietnamese people, were trying to uh, alienate the Champa people. And they decided there was no study about Champa civilization. They started Institute of Studies for the Chams. But it was only until 1990s that the British started studying about the relationships between the Champa people and the Malay people and they realized that the connection was very close and intimate. Uh, for example, in um, the 19th century, when the Dai Vets, uh, attacked um, the Chams, the Sultan of Kelantan sent troops up to help. They were very well connected in that way. And even in Kelantan, uh, I think the airport is called Pinkalan Chetpu, right? Uh, the port of Champa. So, when you go to Tringanu and Kelantan and Naratiwat, there are many kampongs with Cham people there and they look exactly like Malay people, they speak Malay language. And I went to some of the villages in Vietnam and it was a complete Malayu kampong where people spoke Mal Malay and dressed exactly like the people in Kelantan. And as you go further, you can see in the Philippines, in fact, Raffles in his uh, book History of Java already said that the south of Philippines is included in the Malay world. And uh, if you read, read the history of uh, Sulu Island here, and uh, Mindanao, the early sultans were the Arab Malays from Johor. And also in Brunei, the court was connected to Johor. And later, the, the uh, Sultan Tengah married into the Sambas and Manpower families and created the Malay kingdoms in the coast of Borneo. And because the Bugis and the Malays were well assimilated in, in uh, the late 16th century, many Malays, Malay people uh, escaping from the Portuguese invasion went to Makassar and set up a Kampong Malayu in Makassar. And we know a lot of Bugis in 1699 uh, uh, sorry, escaped escaped to uh, the Real Islands, and later from the Real Islands, uh, the Bugis went to, sorry, how do I do this? Went to the uh, coast, the west coast of Kalimantan. So all this here is my periphery of the Malay world as I saw the connection in textiles, okay? So when I talk about the Malay world and the Malays of the Malay world, it's not just from the Malay Peninsula and from Sabah and Sarawak, but from the whole um, Malay world that you see here. Okay. So even today, uh, the Malay world, who belongs to the Malay world is disputed. The Filipinos who, of Luzon, who are now Catholics, uh, believe that they are part of the Malay world still. Uh, but uh, most uh, Malays consider a Malay as someone who is uh, adopting um, Malay customs and also religion. Uh, here you see uh, the regions. I, I think I, I gave you all uh, a printout of this so you don't have to look at it. Uh, but these, you can go home and investigate all the different countries that I've included in the Malay world. So what is Malay batik? I've divided it into four categories. Uh, it's batiks made by Malays for Malay people. Second, it's batiks made by others for the Malays. So you'd be surprised that many people made batiks for the Malays. In fact, uh, only one quarter of Malay batiks were made in Malaysia. The other quarter was made in Sumatra, especially in South Sumatra, in Jambi, and Bengkulu, in west, southwest Sumatra. 
and then a big portion, 50% of batiks of the Malays were made in Java. Okay. Uh, so it's made by others for the Malays. Uh, here you have batiks uh, made for others that the Malays also favoured. So you have um, different product, uh, producers of uh, batiks. You have the Indo-Europeans, you have the Chinese, Peranakans, and you have the Arab, Indo-Arabs. So there was a big Arab community in Krab Yap in North Pakalongan that made batiks for the Malay people and also for the Indo-Europeans. And the Pakalongan Malay, uh, Chinese people, when they made Peranakan batiks, it happens that the Malays liked some of them. It was not made for the Malays, but the Malays bought a lot of them because they liked the colour scheme. Uh, we'll go through detail of, details of that later. Um, and then we have... Sorry. Uh, imitation batiks. Um, there were many imitation batiks made for the Malay mass market in Malaysia, in Thailand, in Japan, and in Europe. And we'll go through those later. Uh, so you can see you have batiks uh, made for the Malays, by the Malays in the Malay Peninsula, and then in Sumatra as a quarter, and the coastal islands. And then half was made by the Javanese for the Malay market. And now you have batiks I have, uh, this talk is quite long, so I made it more simple by dividing it to three major sections. So I hope you can follow me. The first section is batiks by region. Okay, so you have several regions that I talked about just now, Sumatra, Malaysia, and Java. Okay, then batiks by types. We have different types of batiks, like batik wayang kulit, batik kosong, batik basurak. Okay, and then batiks by colour. So these are the regions. In the Malay Peninsula, most of the batiks were produced uh, in uh, the north of Malaysia and includes some of the southern Thai uh, provinces, uh, such as Songkla, Naratiwat, and Patani. And then in Sumatra, it's ma mainly Jambi, Bengkulu, some in Aceh, now they make some in Beritong and Bintan. And in Java, uh, those are the many places that made them. So now we go to, by region, to the Malay Peninsula. And we can see in this map, uh, this is from Ma'unku's book, uh, your map showing the different places in Malaysia that made batiks. And you can see here, um, most of the dots here, the brown dots, represent the batik ateliers in Malaysia. And there's nothing in Pahang or Johor or, or Negris in Milan, but you see a few around Kuala Lumpur in Selangor. And uh, so the, there are only three states that produce batik. Okay? And mostly in Kelantan and Trengan. And what kind of batiks do they produce? The, the batiks that we see today, for example, Professor Salma, she's wearing a beautiful batik tulis uh, produced in Malaysia probably uh, in uh, Kelantan or Tringanu. And you can see it's a batik tulis. Okay. And how is batik tulis done? It's by a canting uh, a batik wax pen, where they put the wax here and draw the outlines. It's very different from the batik tulis of Indonesia. This is where the outlines are drawn, and then the colors are painted, painted between the outlines, and then when it's, um, it's dyed, the outlines will become white, okay? And you, be, uh, you get very uh, pretty and beautiful batik tulis such as these. And in uh, uh, fashion shows, you can see the traditional Malay baju kurong and the uh, contemporary men's shirt in batik tulis like this. And in the kampongs, you can see this kind of, sorry, uh, this kind of uh, batiks, uh, batik tulis. This was purchased in Kraft Tangan in Kuala Lumpur. 
what came before batik tulis? Batik chap. Okay. So uh, the history of Malay batiks actually only started in 1920s. Uh, when batik chap uh, started, it was brought by some Javanese uh, uh, workmen. Uh, I think there's a Rad Radan Mako. He came to uh, Kelantan, Kota Baru, and it was um, an entrepreneur. His name was uh, Haji Jech Su. He invited him to teach them the batik uh, chop. And batik chop started in Indonesia in 1850, uh, when there was a huge demand uh, from international buyers and from local buyers for batiks. And sometimes for the hand-painted batiks in those days, it takes a month to produce, and they found out that by using batik chop, just doing the chops, they could produce 20 a day, 20 batiks a day. So there's a big difference, and so they could satisfy the market. So when the Malaysians heard of this batik, they asked the Japanese to come over to teach them how to do the production, and this is how it's done. The chops are done in the wax, and then they were printed onto the cloth, and then put in the dye. And this is the result. These are um, about 1960s, these batiks. You can tell by the color scheme they have. Uh, and this I found on the clothes lines hanging in Tringanu in my last visit to Tringanu. So maybe some grandmother was hanging her old batiks. You can see the holes here. Uh, but this is the traditional batik done in batik chop. Okay, see it's from Tringanu, you can see. Um, and what came before batik chop? So the tradition of batik in Indonesia is uh, several hundred years, but in Malaysia, the batik started from actually pelangi, which is tie-dye. Um, when they wanted to tie-dye the patterns, they used a wooden block. They carved a wooden block into the pattern they wanted, and they put it on a, a red coloring, and they stamped it on the cloth, and they used a needle and thread to stitch the outlines and then they would dye it, and then you have this zigzag pattern around the edges. That was the palangi that they made, uh, dependent on these wooden blocks. And this uh, uh, technique actually comes from India. Uh, in Tringanu, they call it uh, batik terak or batik puku. In Kelantan, they call it batik puku. And the batik blocks were used in, uh, in the north all the way. I found in Songkla here, uh, uh, up here, number one, you can see in Songkla, the museum here, and in Naratiwat, and in Yala, Patani, they were all making batiks by blocks in the old days because I saw in the antique shops some of these old wooden blocks. And also, when I went to Sumatra, uh, and I went all the way to Daiklinga here, in this island, at the museum there, I saw them using, I saw examples of wooden blocks. So here you can see uh, the batik blocks, uh, the way it's printed. Usually the cloth is a fine cotton cloth imported from India. And uh, you have the pattern, the pachet robong here. You can see it's printed like this. Uh, and it's quite, it's, it's not as halus as the copper blocks. So when I went to Narati, uh, Naratiwat and Songkla, I went all the way up to the Folklore Museum Institute uh, uh, of southern Thailand, which is up here, you can see. And we had to cross this, it's the longest bridge in Thailand, to get to an island uh, on the lake here. And um, it's the Koyo Island. And there you find a museum. It's the Folk Art Museum in the Thaksin University. And in there, you see both uh, examples of the wood blocks and the copper blocks. So before the copper blocks came the wood blocks. So you will ask me, why do they call it batik when it's just wooden blocks printing onto the cloth? In the old days, they didn't really differentiate. They call batik for everything that looks like a print. So for us today, batik, you really need to use the wax to have the wax resist. But in the old days, these block batiks were also prints, block prints were also called batik. Okay, this is the style of batik, and when you look at it, it actually looks very much like the Kelantan Tringanu style that was influenced by the Indonesian Pakolangan style. 
And then when I went all the way south, just now it was all the way north in Thailand, I went all the way south to this, uh, this island, Daiklinga, where the Malay Kingdom moved after Malacca and Johor. Um, I found a, a, the production of block batiks too. Uh, this is in the Chahaya Linga Museum in Pulau Linga. You see, this is from the museum, and this is the type of batik they did on the batik uh, Bajukuro from the woodblock batik. So, could batik chap Tringanu have been inspired by Indian woodblock prints on chins? Chins is a fine cotton. So, in the old days in the Malay world, there was a lot of import of um, Malay textiles, and Malacca was the center for this import. And later, they sent it out to Tringano and Kalantan. And most of these textiles were wooden block prints on cloth. And these came from India. So I'm asking, could these wood blocks inspire the ones that were created in Tringano and Kalantan? And I think it is, because uh, you can see this uh, piece here. I found in Tringano. And I suspect it comes from India. It's a wood block print. Okay, so there were pieces that exist. There are still pieces that exist from the 18th and 19th century coming from India that may have inspired the woodblock prints of Tringani and Kalantan. And in the old days, they would call these Batik Kada, which is interesting because Kada doesn't produce any. It's just that Kada people bought a lot of them from Tringani and Kalantan. Uh, and you can see uh, there is a Batik Kada here. It's done with woodblock prints. Uh, because it's only one-sided. In batik, you have it on both sides. And it's very interesting because when you look at the pattern, it's actually the state symbol for Kelantan. Uh, Kedah, sorry. And then here, uh, they forgot to carve it on the reverse. They carve it the right way around, so when they printed it, it was the ballet. Okay. So somebody said, why don't you turn the sarong the other side? But there's nothing on the other side. So it's, uh, it's very interesting. So these um, was found online. I bought online. Um, uh, came, comes from Kedah. But Kedah didn't print this. They must have ordered it from either Kelantan or Tringanu in the early days. Okay. So these are the blocks okay, that you see. This is the tech, in the National Textile Museum in KL. And then from there, um, uh, the, the people who did these blocks were uh, Haji Chech Su in Kota Baru and in Kuala Tringanu was Haji Ali. So these two entrepreneurs started the Batik woodblock factories and then later they invited the Javanese and started the copper blocks and made a lot of money from this and today their company still exists. Okay, these are the early woodblocks from, uh, from Kelantan that now is in the National Museum in Singapore. This is also in the National Museum in Singapore, but they come from Kelantan, the early period of the 1930s and 40s. And then the later period, maybe uh, also 1930s and 40s, but um, maybe slightly later because the colors have become brighter. And then these are 19, early 20th century, maybe 1940s uh, to 50s. And these are the later ones, 1980s to 2000. And these are the latest ones, but you can see it's for the Malay market because these are sapras. And what are sapras? The Malays will use it for makan, right? They put it on the floor. Uh, it's very dynamic in that uh, pattern. These are other examples of contemporary Tringanu batiks. And then you come up you come across things like this. I posted this on Facebook, and I had many people saying, John, you did, your posting is incorrect. This is not Malay batik. This is Javanese, because it's the Sawat pattern of Java. But uh, the thing is, many people do not know that in the old days, the Javanese patterns were the most popular here because they didn't have their own patterns in the old days. So what they did was they ordered uh, people to go to Java and buy up the blocks and bring it back to Tringanu and Kelantan and they used the copper blocks. They didn't make their own before. They used the ones uh, from the antique shops in, in, in Java. And the reason why I say that this is not 
uh, Javanese is because the cotton feels very thin, unlike uh, and not as fine as the Javanese cotton. That's number one. And the pattern is slightly different. I've checked all the sawat patterns in Java. There's a slight difference and it's quite rough, the workmanship. Okay. So it, it, you have to see that there's a trend of using Indonesian textiles and appreciating uh, Indonesian textiles in Malaysia. So this proves, uh, this Baju Kurong from the 1930s uh, proves my fact because it's using uh, Batik Tiga Nigri from Surakarta. Okay, and it's made into a Baju Kurong. Now we know that the Javanese do not use Baju Kurong. It's typical of a Malay fashion. But they use Indonesian uh, Batik instead of uh, Malay batik. This was printed and made in Indonesia and then cut up to make uh, a baju kurung in Malaysia. You can see the, uh, you know, the typical tulang balut here. Uh, it's a teluk blangang baju kurung. Uh, and then I came across this batik. Uh, it was sold to me as a safra. Uh, it's the same size as these square safras, but it has a wine coolant figure of bima. And this figure, uh, when you look at it, you definitely say this is Batik Indonesia. But look at the sign here. It says Yusuf Muhammad. So who is Yusuf Muhammad? Anybody knows? He is actually the son of Haji Chesu and uh, it's Kota Bar, uh, from Kota Baru in Kelantan. So it, it puzzled me a lot because I said in Kelantan they have their own wayang kulit. So why don't they use their own wayang kulit? Oh, you know the difference, right? The wayang kulit in Kelantan is using the Thai uh, conical hat, not this Javanese style headdress. But in those days, they appreciated Indonesian culture and batiks, so they used that uh, pattern. And you can see even today, when I went to Craft Tangan in uh, Kelantan, I saw them selling uh, saputangans with the Indonesian prints. So I think they still have the old Indonesian blocks and they still use it. And I went to Craft Tangan uh, Kuala Lumpur two days ago, and they also sell these. And in the hotel here, um, the hotel in the Bangi Golf Course that I stayed, on the walls they have in Malaysian artists batik work, but still using Indonesian wayang kulit rather than Kelantanese wayang kulit. So there is this cultural um, uh, appreciation, I would call, of Indonesian textiles. So can you see this is the difference? the Malaysian version and the Indonesian version. Okay. The Malaysian uh, wayang kulit, it has this conical hat. Okay. Whereas the, the Javanese one is more ornate on the sides. So then you have this problem coming up. In the last uh, Miss Malaysia contest, uh, the Indonesians were screaming and objecting to the use of their batik uh, but the thing is, they do not know that we appreciated their batiks from a long time ago. It has become, that we have assimilated with the Indonesian batiks and it's part of our culture. They said, oh, the uh, parang rusa, which is this pattern, is a um, very uh, sacred pattern, only reserved for the royalty. But when you go to Indonesia, uh, everyone is wearing parang rusa. It's a common uh, uh, batik now. It's not restricted to the court. So I do not see anything wrong with, I mean, she could be wearing a Cuban textile or Mexican textile, right? It, it, we, we, we share textiles with each other. Um, and you have the same problem coming up in a recent uh, Mr. Malaysia show where people said that uh, the representative from Kuching, Sarawak, was using the, the Kalimantan uh, motifs. But the Kalimantan motifs also exist in Sarawak, you see. Um, so I'm, I'm saying that if you know the history of the whole of the Malay world, um, there is a huge repertoire to a, 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 a use in your patterns and designs. You're not restricted to this particular region. 
And now because of colonialism and nationalism, we become separated and we become like protective of these designs. When in the old days, we shared with each other. And perhaps we can use this old example for thinking of how we can uh, coordinate with each other uh, in terms of international problems. For example, like the recent haze. You know, instead of refusing the help from the nations, we could say we are brothers. You know, we shared a common heritage before. Let's get together and solve this problem before it's too late. Um, so the next region we go to is in Sumatra, where we go to uh, most important area is Jambi and Bengkulu. Okay. Uh, and where is Jambi? Uh, Jambi was in the old days called the Kingdom of Malayu. Uh, how do we know that? Because in uh, 671, when I Ching the monk traveled there, uh, he recorded that he went to uh, the kingdom called Malayu, and it was in the region above uh, Srivijaya, uh, above Palembang. And after that, he traveled to uh, uh, Kedah, and then later to Nalanda, India, to study uh, Buddhism. So you have the early records in the Chinese history books about Jambi. Um, so what is, um, uh, why is Jambi producing batiks? Okay. Uh, I think it started um, in the late 18th century, early 19th century uh, with the Arabs. Uh, there was an Arab migration uh, from Yemen. There were many Hyderabad uh, Muslim Arabs that migrated uh, from uh, Arabia and Yemen to Singapore and Malaysia and to Sumatra. And the family that uh, arrived in Jambi in the 1830s was the El Jufri family. Okay? And uh, the family was made famous by um, Pengaran uh, Wijo Kusumo. Uh, he was made a prince by the Sultan uh, Nazuruddin uh, because he uh, was an Arab that was well uh, learned. Uh, he was well learned in Islam and uh, he built a mosque and they used, um, they employed him to be uh, the intermediary between the Dutch because Sultan Nasruddin hated the Dutch and he went up to the river to hide when the Dutch came to discuss business with them. So it was the Arabs who took over and they became very rich from having business with the Dutch. In fact, uh, most of the houses that belonged to the Sultan were dilapidated Atta wooden houses that they call the Istana. But when you look at uh, uh, this uh, Arab house, uh, it's actually quite amazing because it, it's a mansion, a uh, concrete mansion, uh, whereas the Sultan's palace is like this. This is uh, Sultan Taha is the son of Sultan Nasruddin. Okay, so uh, his mansion is not far from the batik workshops in Jambi. And, uh, when I went to Palembang and the, to the museum there, they would look at the batiks and they said, Oh, ini batik aljufri. And I said, What's batik aljufri? So let's have a look. It's this style of batik, which is uh, very Arabic in design with these arabesque uh, floral patterns uh, that is still popular today. All these are batik basurik. Um, and the person who made the Al Jufri family famous was Idris uh, Al Jufri. Uh, he, um, his son also married the daughter of the Sultan, and he became the richest man in Jambi. And I think it's because of that they were able to order their own batiks. But their batiks became so popular that besides the Arabs, the Malays also loved it. It became prestigious to wear a batik Al Jufri, so they would be not enough produced in Jambi and they would order it from Chiribon and they would send patterns to Lassem to make. So many of these are made in Lassem. The Lassem ones look a bit orange, red in colour because the acidity of the water in Lassem is different from that in Jambi. The Jambi reds are more purplish red whereas the Lassem is orange red. This is also Batik Al Jufri. It's very fine uh, Batik work. 
uh, where actually the animals are there. You can see little birds, but they're not exactly that recognizable as animals. And I think this is because it's for the Muslim market. And this we call uh, kudung. In Sumatra, they call it kudung. Here we call it a tudung. Okay, you can tell because of the edge here, they call the sisir or the hair. And a salendam would what be one with uh, a fichet robong. A, a tudung is one with uh, the sisir. And the sarong is one that has the fichet robong in the center. So this is a kudung. Okay, also al -Jufri. And this is another kudung. And the format comes from Indian textiles because in Sumatra there were many Indian textiles imported there. So there is the two schools of thought because Sumatran batiks were not really uh, discovered until the 1980s when um, Fiona Kerala from uh, Hunt University uh, did her PhD thesis on it stating that Sumatra had an independent batik production uh, aside from Java. And uh, she showed that the, the textiles are quite different and Batik al Jufri is one type of Sumatran textiles from, uh, from Jambi. And this is how I would assume that the, the Arab uh, Malays would be dressed in Jambi because uh, they were very simple and elegant. And this is the Batik al Jufri, Selendang and, and Sarong with the Baju Panjang. Okay. And in general, uh, Jambi batiks, you can see, have their own characteristic. This is a batik kudong basida. Basida means to get together. So the women, when they get together in the mosque, they will wear this kind of head shawl. And probably it comes from an Indian uh, tradition. Uh, these are imported Indian textiles that were found in Sumatra. And they have the batik kalingan which is the blue and white batiks, um, mostly geometric patterns developed from Indian textiles. And this is a beautiful piece, uh, batik bangbiru, uh, batik kalingan, sorry, or batik biru. And this is batik kalingan, and it's called, the pattern is called batangari, it's from the river batangari. And the pattern comes from Indian tree of life pattern. You can see here the tree of life. And here you have actually uh, found in Jambi, but I think this batik is from Lasem. It's called Bangbangan, Batik Bangbangan. And this is another Batik Bangbangan, uh, Baju uh, Panjang. And this is a Batik Bangbiru, blue and red. It's a kudong with the Basidang pattern. This is another one. They're quite rare nowadays. And here is the Bunga Jato. It's a traditional uh, batik used for weddings because before the wedding, uh, the bride's friends would go to the garden and collect all the bunga jato and bring to her room to make her room more fragrant. Uh, this is the tradition that they, they told me in Jambi. And these are other patterns of Jambi batiks. And a lot of these copy the kind sambagi from India. And this is a very interesting one with... Uh, Again, you cannot figure out whether it's a fish or not, but I think you can see some fish tail here, but the head is not that clear. It could be a carp. Okay, on, and uh, one way of distinguishing what is Sumatran batiks as opposed to Javanese batiks is uh, it's called batik sisihan, meaning that the, the right and the left sides are different. Can you see? So, uh, Hans Herringer, Rens Herringer from uh, Holland, when she lived in Java, she found out from the Malay women living in Sumatra that the way they use these uh, kain panjang lepas uh, as sarongs is the young ladies, before they got married, would wrap the sarong in such a way that the red is in front, and then when they got married, is the dark side is in front. So it, it, it shows whether you are married or not. So this is a tradition of the Malay people in Sumatra. And this is a popular but rare motif. I found this in the Jambi Museum. It's called uh, Batik Kapal Sangat. Also Batik Bangbiru in terms of color. 
And these are, you can see the batik sisihan, red and blue. And another interesting jambi batik, which you'll see in the exhibition, I use it as a salan, salan down, is the batik chili padi. And you see all these little chili padis? And also this is a sisihan. This is for, uh, one side is for the younger woman and the other side is for the older woman. And another interesting batik I found in Jambi is the batik kosong. Have you ever seen batiks like this? Where the center field is completely empty. I thought this very interesting. And I wonder, because the design is so strong, if there was a specific meaning to this kind of batik, where nothing is put in the center. So I think it may relate to the kind lima basong kit in um, Palembang. They have a specific kind of kind lima where the center field is empty and it's actually green. And according to many books in Malay, in Sumatra, and in English research books, I found that they, they, they interviewed local people and they said these were used by widows who want to get married, to get remarried. So they are shy to tell the men they like they want to get remarried. They wear a selendang kosong in the center that's green. And the purple one is for a, a, a widow that's already getting married. And I'm not sure what the yellow one is because there are three colors. But in India, the saris with the yellow empty feel is usually for weddings. Okay? So uh, it's a ceremonial kind of textiles. And I'm, I'm wondering if the batiks with the empty centers relate to the limas and could have been used by widows. Janda, uh, Baras, they call it. Burhias. So this is how it was worn. It's quite elegant. And then they have batik basurek or basurat, uh, where they use uh, Arabic script to make the pattern. And this is a modern piece uh, and made for hanging for wedding day. And for the blue and white ones, this is usually used for uh, the tutup karanda, for the cops, okay, for funerals. And then out, outside Jambi, uh, in, on the islands, for example, in Tanjong Pinang, in Bintan Island, uh, south of Singapore, here, Singapore is here. You know, when I traveled here, it was the first time I realized the Malay world outside Singapore. When I told a lot of my friends that I'm going to uh, Riau, they say, where is Riau? It's because in the Singapore educational system, they wanted to stamp out the Indonesian side of the Malay world. And um, lately, only that many people are traveling to Bintan uh, because now it's a resort for Singaporeans. But the historical area is in the south. And here in Tanjung Pinang, they have Kota Tanjung Pinang. In the port, they have a sculpture of a, a siput, which they call gong gong there. A shellfish. Every night when you go there, your friends in Tanjung Pinang will invite you to have gong gong for dinner. And all the batiks have this gong gong on it. It's another batik gong gong. Uh, and then in Belitong, they also have batiks, but I think they haven't come up with their own specific identity, whereas in Tanjung Pinang they have. Um, then from there we go to um, batik Java from the Sumatran market. And then from last time you have batik Bangbiru, Bangbangan, which is red and cream. This is batik Bangbangan. Bang Bangan, not used by the Javanese, but for the Malays. Batik Kalingan, this pattern, all the blue and whites. This one with airplanes, which is quite interesting. Um, the Malays in Sumatra love all these modern patterns. Sometimes you have airplanes, sometimes you have uh, cars, uh, umbrellas, and things like that. Uh, batik Bangbiru, which is red and blue and cream. This is Batik Bangbiru Sisihan. You can see both sides are different. And I think this is made in Batang. Batang is famous for making batiks with animals, but you cannot actually see the animals because it's a very conservative Muslim place. So um, they made batiks for the Sumatran market as well. And it's also Batik Sisihan. Both sides are different. 
And I found this piece in Turkey, a uh, nice uh, 1900s to 1920 early batik. It's very fine uh, batik uh, bambiru for the Sumatran market. And these are other examples, bambiru, bambiru. And for the European market, uh, the Europeans also made batik bambiru, but the Malays love them. We found a lot in Sumatra of this style. See, this is very Art Nouveau, European style, that was found in Malay Kampong in Sumatra. So they appreciated this uh, European style, but it was not specifically made for them. Okay. This is also a European style batik. And this as well. So there was a big Indo-European community in Java that made batiks and they tried to sell it to all kinds of people, to the Chinese, to the Malays, and to the Arabs. And uh, they were very successful, and uh, many were found in Sumatra. And then I found these very psychedelic batiks. And where are these from? I managed to buy some in uh, Patani, and then I saw some also in Palembang. But when I went to the source, which is Chiribon, I never saw any. So these were specifically made for export from Chiribon for the Malay market. It's very psychedelic. And the purple and green was the color scheme. This, this I found in Song Club. And then Batik Grisik is also in Java, in East Java. It's a Batik town, but no longer produces batik. So if you want to find batik grisik, you can only find it in Sumatra. It's very popular uh, with the Sumatran Malays, and they ordered a lot of it, and uh, it's usually in this color scheme, blue and red and cream. So these are different batik grisiks. It's very geometric uh, pattern, mo almost like a Mughal Persian pattern. And these are copying Indian chins patterns, also found in Sumatra. These are copying Indian chins, Bambiru, Bambiru Ungu, with purple. And then from Pachitan also you have batiks for the Malay market. I found many uh, batik Pachitans uh, from Java, central Java, in uh, Sumatra. Then we go to central Java in Jogja and Surakarta. These standard uh, uh, court textiles with the parang rusak patterns were very popular with the Malay community, not only in Sumatra, but also in Malaysia. So this is a set from Selengo. Uh, I purchased this uh, uh, baju, uh, sorry, uh, this kabaya. Uh, it's not a Peranakan kabaya because it has the crescent and the stars embroidered on it. So it's typically for a Malay lady, and I bought it from uh, a Malay lady in Selangor uh, together with the sarong. So this is the way they would dress in Malaysia, and the Javanese princess would be dressed this way. As you can see here, the same pattern of the uh, parang rusak nitik, the small parang rusak pattern, but they have these velvet black baju uh, kabayas. And in the 50s and 60s, in Saloma's period, this was very popular. Uh, Salom, Saloma would love one of these uh, Javanese uh, solo or Jogja Parangrosa patterns. And some of them with flowers. Then now we go to the types, which is, I think, very interesting for me. Uh, we go quickly into Batik Basurek, which is this, the Batik with uh, Arabic calligraphy on it. Uh, used for funerals or weddings. The red ones would be used for funerals and also for clothing for children as a protective uh, covering, as you can see on this uh, vest of a young boy. And I think you can see the creative mindset of the Malay people through these textiles because every piece uh, uses the same wording. Sometimes it's a shahada in it, uh, but in a different format. Uh, and there are hundreds of different formats. Uh, I, have, I have maybe... Uh, 150 of these, and every one has a different pattern. You can see it's very unusual. Uh, they were made in different places, uh, Chiribon, uh, Jambi, and Benkulu. These are the main places that produce them, but mostly for the Sumatran market. You see very little in Chiribon, used by the 
the Javanese. Actually, you can only see them in the court, but you see quite a lot in Sumatra. See, this is in the court in, in the Karaton Kasepuhan, uh, one of the palaces in Chiribon, and you can see one of the Batik Basurat hanging as a flag in the background of the throne. And I found a similar example in Kelantan. This is Kelantan Islamic Museum. There's one flag exactly the same, but in red, hanging there. So it's for the Malay market. Yes. And these are the beautiful examples you can see that they use for Ikat Kapala, especially when men go and fight, or they do a silat uh, uh, performance and practice. They wear an Ikat Kapala with a batik calligraphy, uh, or batik basurat, to protect them as a form of protection. This has the words of the four prophets of Allah there, um, this piece, and here you have these few pieces. Uh, I was very happy, most of my pieces I found in uh, Jambi, and I found in uh, Palemba, but uh, I found some in Tringanu, and I was so happy to find these two pieces, very fine pieces in Tringanu, which I believe came from Cheribon. But when I went to Leiden and I gave a lecture at the Leiden Res uh, Textile Research Center, I found that I found exactly a, a skirt with exactly the same pattern as my Batik Pasurik that I bought in Tringanu. And I said, what's going on? How come they have Tringanu textiles? And my friend who was with me said, oh no, John, this is made in Holland. I said, no, it can't be. It has Islamic script. He says, yes, the Dutch made imitation batiks for the Malay market. And I, I still couldn't believe it. And then she told me the story. In the, in the 1930s and 40s, when uh, the uh, demand for batik became great, uh, the Dutch tried to uh, get involved in the market by producing uh, printed, wax printed, machine printed batiks and they were very successful in doing it and the Malays and Indonesians were importing a lot of it and this skirt was actually made for young boys in this island called um, Marken, a small island not far from Amsterdam. Now this is a very conservative Christian island uh, but they believe in spirits and they believe that the spirits will take away your young boy unless you dress them as a girl. So all the young boys were dressed in colourful aprons. You see here? And some of the aprons used this batik basure, which was produced in Holland. Uh, uh, this is the person who invented it in 1846. He opened a company to produce imitation batiks uh, for the Malay market and later when uh, Indonesia banned it, they exported it to Africa. So these are two pieces that I purchased, recently made. The company still exists. It's over 200 year company. It's called Vilsco. Okay, but they are not cheap and they are hard to come by because uh, they make only uh, four meters at a time of one particular design and then when it's sold, they don't repeat it until after a long period of time. And these Malay style batiks, which were popular with the Malays, are now popular in Africa. They're being sold in Africa now, by the Dutch. So that was very new to me. And this is from Cherry Bond. It's, the red ones are more rare. I have one, this is over 100 years old. Uh, I found this in Palembang, but it was made in Cherry Bond. And it was used as a lalangit. See this, uh, because many of the old ones have damage on the corners, so we can know that probably at the wedding, it was used like this. This was a recent uh, Bugis ceremony that I attended, and this in Makassar. And this is how it was used in the old days. Or they were used as little boys' vests to protect uh, a young boy from getting sick. These are the other patterns. And this is a very unusual one called Batik Bas Basura Siang Malam. They are both Pattern is different on, diff on each side. One is dark and the other one is uh, light. And another category is the batik wayang kulit. So people ask me, how do I know that these are for Malay people? 
the Indonesians use batik mayakuli. So when I checked and compared, there's one big difference. Can you guess what it is? If you actually look at the textile carefully, all these characters have names. The Sumatran Malays were not as familiar as Wayankulit, as with the Wayankulit stories as the Javanese. So when the Javanese made it for the Malays, they added the names so they remember who the characters are. So these, the ones with the names, are usually the ones for the Malay market in Sumatra, not for the Javanese. Okay, this is a rare sarong um, from the 1950s and 60s. And this is a lendang. You can, can you see the name here? Anoman, meaning Hanuman. Right? This is Hanuman. And there's, uh, there's a name here, and there's a name somewhere here, I cannot hear, I think. And these also were made, um, Selendang and uh, uh, Gendongans for carrying the babies with the batik, these were made in Pakalongan for the Malay market. Most of these were found in Sumatra, but you don't see them in, in Pakalongan. And then you have this, also a batik wayang kulit, I found in Komering in South Sumatra. Now these are the, Japanese, uh, the Javanese types. Most of the Javanese types were made for the Dutch, for export. Uh, very seldom you see the Javanese using it. This is in Tropen Museum. It's a fantastic uh, Wayang Kulit Batik. But I don't think you see Indonesian Javanese wearing this type. It's not in their tradition. Um, and then you can see it's, it's made, the Batik with Wayang Kulit, it's made for the European Catholic market. This is a church in Jakarta, Catholic church where you can see uh, a Mary of Assumption wearing a uh, batik uh, baju panjang here with batik uh, wayang kulit. And these were all exported to um, Holland and found in the Dutch museums. This is a recent one that I discovered in the Hatono collection in Jakarta. It's also probably made for the Dutch, but you can see they're very fine and dynamic. This is a detail from it. And this is worn by the Javanese, not by the Malays, because there are no names on it. Okay. And this is the traditional Wayang Kulit they call um, Chit Toning, worn by men in their 60s. Only wise men can wear it because all the stories they know by heart and they can tell the children about it. When the children point, oh, what's the story in this? So it's all batik tulis, but every square is different. And another category is batik lokchan. It's the silk batiks that the Malays love. It was made in Rembang and Juana, these two places in north central uh, Java. And the people who loved it were the Sumatrans in Minangkabau, the Sumatran Malays in Minangkabau, and also in Bali. So these were the two places that exported them. And you can see in old pictures that these are the Minangkabau people wearing the uh, Lokchan. You can see the way it's draped is obviously silk. Um, and this is the Minangkabau Baju uh, Panjang and Baju Kurong using uh, Kain Lokchan. And this, my friend in Minang, she still wears it, her grandmother's uh, silk Lokchan. Lok means uh, Lü, green, and chan means silk chan, so it means green silk uh, batiks or cloth, and they say that the cloth, the silk comes from Shantung province, and was popular with the Javanese, uh, but not used by the Javanese, mostly by the Balinese and the Malays. Uh, this is uh, in Solok, in South Sumatra, where the men also use it as uh, a scarf, here. These are the types that they use. And then you come to batik nitik, which is an Indo-Arab batik. The Arabs were very famous for doing nitik. You know what nitik is, right? It's the dotting, dots. So they carved little pieces of wood in rectangular and triangular shapes. And they would use this, and they would go and dot the whole batik like this. And sometimes it takes six months to finish dotting one but they were very good at it and were very expensive. So only the European, Indo-European ladies who had clients for them would buy from the Indo-Arabs. And there were people who copied it, but the quality is not as good. 
So how do I know that the Malays like this? Because in my travels in the Malay world, I managed to go to a small place called Pangkalan Bun. Has anyone heard of Pangkalan Bun? Anyone? I've never heard of it, and you, but I found out it was a Malay kingdom related to the court of Banjarmasin, which is also Malay. And they had a palace, a wooden palace from the uh, 1890s. So I entered the palace and I found a cabinet full of textiles worn by the seven princesses, uh, daughters of the sultan. So I, took, I photographed every textile and I found batik knitting there. And I also found some in Sumatra. So I can confirm that it was a style that the Malays liked. Okay. And you can see that it is not, it, even though it's made in Kalongan by the Indo-Arabs, it was made in the north village called uh, Krak Yap. Uh, it's made for the Malay market because of these Islamic symbols here. Can you see? The star and the moon. And, but the design is done by an Hindu Dutch. She did the design and she asked an Hindu Arab to do the pattern, the waxing and the printing. And then she sold it to the Malay. So designed by Hindu Dutch, done by Arabs, and then sold to the Malays. So this is the one I found in Pangalampur. Can you see the dotting? See, these are all done by little dots by hand. It's called knitting. Okay. And this is a fine one um, from my collection. And this is from Peter Lee's collection in Singapore. These are one by the Dutch. You can tell by the kabaya here. It's a Dutch style kabaya. The, the Peranakan Nonya kabaya is usually pointed at the end. Um, and this is the Malay style. Uh, you can see here the nitik is here. Can you see the nitik? The dotting. And it, it suits the Malay taste because of the very geometric patterns and the subdued colors. And this is nitik with prada, means a telopo or gold leaf on top. So they will dot it in batik and then dot it in gold. Okay. And the next uh, category is prada or telopo, where after they do the batik pattern, they would um, mix a glue in, in Java. Uh, they use a glue made out of uh, powdered fish bone. In Malaysia, they use alum uh, resin from a tree to make the glue. And what they do is they put the glue on the, the arm and they take a chop, for example, the shape of a flower. They put the glue on the arm and then they put it on the textile and then they put the gold leaf on the textile and they secure it by pasting it on and then when it's dried, they they, they use a brush to wipe off the, the ones that, the, the places that are not uh, attached. So this is the Prada technique, which is very expensive. And it's used by the Sumatran Malays because they believe they came from the land of gold. It was called uh, Subarana Dipa, um, the land of gold. And the Malays of Sumatra were famous for conspicuous consumption. During the weddings, if you go to a Sumatran wedding, the ladies and the men will be decked in gold. And they have many necklaces and they will show off their textiles by piling it up. Stacks of textiles. They have a table long like this and they'll stack up all their textiles to show their wealth. And then, you know, people will give money to them and then they will open all the packets of money and put a light and count it in front of everyone to show how wealthy they are. So this is the style of uh, Sumatran Malays. And by showing this gold, uh, they can show... Um, their wealth. And this tradition comes much earlier from the Indian Sambagis, these are Indian textiles, where they put gold leaf on the Indian textiles. And you can see it's only on one section. Why? Because when they roll up the Kainalapas, the rolled up section, if it's gold, it will be all crushed. So it's only the section that is not uh, rolled up. It's shown in the front here. Um, sorry. Okay. This is another one. There's a detail here to show you how fine it is. The gold. You can see the piece outside. And then this is how it's worn in the wedding. Uh, I got this from Facebook and the, the faces were blocked, so I don't know who it is. But the, um, a Malay wedding in Palembang, where the bride uses, it's a rare photo. This, uh, you can see it's glowing, it's Prada on Batik. And this is from my collection, beautiful pieces. And 
in the Malay wedding, this would be how it looks. Even the baju kurong and the selendang is all Prada. And you have a baju uh, uh, kebaya pendek with uh, Prada sarong. And these are the new ones where it's no longer gold leaf. They take gold paint and paint over the batik. So it's much cheaper, more affordable. And the gold paint is secure, you can actually wash it. But in the old days, the kind product, you cannot, water cannot go near it. It will dissolve the gold. And this is very different from the Prada used by the Javanese and the clothing of the Javanese. You can see the Javanese were a, a different uh, costume style. And this is uh, the wedding and the Paku Alam that I attended in the south of Jogja. Um, and you can see it's all Prada here, the traditional style, but it's more subdued, not as brightly colored as the Sumatran Malay ones. And then there's another type of batik called Batik Batawi. The Batawi people are the Sundanese people in uh, West Java, and they were mixed with the Dutch, the Indians, and the Chinese, and the Malays. And they have their own culture, but they were part of the Malay world, and they live in Batavia. And they have their own cuisine. And the types of batik they have are very bright colored. Uh, and they used to make a living from selling copra, a lot of coconuts they had uh, grown around the uh, the port of Batavia, and uh, these are the types of batiks they produce with the elephants uh, dancing among the coconut trees. And different color schemes, and the way they put their picturobong is on the sides and at the bottom. And this is another type where you have uh, ayam, chickens here. Um, and this type, I'm not sure where it really comes from. It's called Bati Ayan Den, Den Lape. There's a Malay song called Ayan Den Lape, I think. Uh, the running away chicken. And it's a very popular in the Minang area. And I found these in Padang, in Minang Kabao. Um, and these were batik and hand painting. So what they did do is, they take a cloth and they wax it. The major batik pattern. So for example, a flower. So they wax the flower, and then they put it in the, the, for example here, purple dye. So you have purple background with white flowers. Then you, they use color paint to hand paint the colors in. So a bit like the batik tulis of Malaysia today. And these are examples of this batik, Ayn den Lape. And then you have batiks that I don't know where they are from. They, I think they're done with stenciling. They, put, they cut out uh, paper cuts, they put it on the cloth, and then they paint over it. And this, this is Batik Kotak. Uh, it's very interesting because when Asa Aziz wrote her book, uh, she said that Batik Kotak actually got its name from an old man who sold Batiks that had were put into boxes because they're so soft, right? They can be folded and they were put in boxes and given as presents in boxes. So the box, because there's no kotak pattern on here, so it comes from the history of it's being sold in boxes. So the box is the kotak. But then uh, a new researcher came out with uh, um, the theory that in the 1930s, um, the, the son of Haji Che Su, uh, two sons, Muhammad Saleh and Muhammad Yusuf, they invented silk screen batiks. So the silk screens were in the shape of squares, kota. So they call those silk screen batik kota. And in fact, it's not really batik. They are in fact silk screens. So um, what is the origin of this batik kota? Let's investigate. Okay, so these are come uh, in different colors and quite amazing because you know, you don't know where they're actually made. Maybe they were made in Kelantan by these two brothers, but they were definitely catering for the Malay market because of the motifs. So you can see here, the motif is what? Pulasan, yes. Okay. And here, this motif, is it a Malay motif? Uh, many people say, oh, it's a Peranakan motif, because Peranakans use ipangs, right? These are Victorian glass flower vases imported from England. 
and also in, in silver. But when you go to Malay weddings, they are used. You see them in Malay weddings and Malay homes. So this silver piece was found in a Singapore Malay home. It's now in the Malay Heritage Center. And these pink ones are similar to the ones here, made of Cambry glass. Um, it's, you can see here, there's the same Ipeng here, Ipeng here, and there's one probably here. The use in Malay weddings. This is a Malay wedding in Singapore. And uh, the first one I found was in the Kelantan Museum. And I, was so, I thought it was a Peranakan motif, but it's shared by the Malays as well. So I was so happy to find two. So I now have two of these in my collection, uh, catering for the Malay people. And how were they worn? You can see perhaps in the hot days, the Malay women would wear these because they're thin and silky and cool. So I asked my Malay friends today, do you wear silk sarongs? They say, never. We never wear silk sarongs. I said, really? But we have these silk saris. They said, no lah, we don't wear it like this. We wear it like this, as kalubungs, because it's soft and then it's as, as a head covering. So I, I'm not sure if it was worn um, this way, because we never know in those old days they could have worn it. Maybe today they don't wear it as silk sarongs. But uh, if you look at old pictures, they were actually used as kalubungs. Can you see this pattern? It's almost the same. And the border is very similar to the border here. And the way it drapes looks more like silk than the cotton. This is stiffer here. So it's probably a batik kotang, silk of Japanese habotai silk. It's very fine. They call it habotai, it means light as feather. Okay, so it's a very fine Japanese silk. And here you can see the same. Uh, can you see the pattern? There's a tree here. And this, I have a tree here too. So it probably is also a batik kotak. Now, where is batik kotak really from? Um, Peter Lee, who has written a book on Sarong Kabaya, told me that he found a reference, and this is from his book. And uh, it shows that Japan was the source of imitation batiks of poor quality. A case heard in Singapore courts in 1934 provides an insight into aspects of this commerce. Utram and Company, a shop in Arab Street in Singapore, was accused by the police of selling batik sarongs under the house label of Chakuda Lumba, racing horse brand, and were marked fast color, meaning that the color doesn't run, meaning it's fast dye. Uh, when in fact they were not, when people brought them home, the colors ran. Okay? And one sample was sent to the laboratory, which confirmed the accusation. The proprietor revealed that he had bought 784 pieces from Kobe, Japan. Are they from Japan? Yes. Because on most of mine, I find Japanese script. Although it's also Chinese characters, but it's written more in a Japanese style. The kanji, Japanese kanji. So I can confirm that these came from Kobe, Japan, and only lasted until, after the, until the end, uh, before the war. Uh, 1930s and 40s. And most of them, when you see them, the color has run. You actually cannot wash them. I think they are cheap sarongs for daily wear, as kalubungs, and then after you use it for a while, you just throw them away and buy new ones. And that's why very few have lasted in good condition. So I decided to collect as many as I could in good condition because it records a time and a fashion trend at that time. Uh, if I don't collect it, it will be lost. And we do not know that at one time the Malays liked these Japanese uh, uh, imitation batiks. Okay. And these are other imitation batiks. These are prints I found in Sumatra. Perhaps also, it's not on silk, it's on cotton, but perhaps also inspired by the Japanese. And, and then these uh, were found in uh, Trenganu in the palace, and this is in Kelantan. And probably there was a print factory making Javanese batiks in this style uh, because the color scheme is exactly the same. And then the printed batiks in Thailand. In Thailand, when you go and see, when you look at this, it doesn't look Thai, right? It looks Malay, but the whole of South Thailand, they speak Malay and they have Malayu festival and they have uh, Mat Yong and they have Wayang Kulit and all the Malay food that you eat is very different from mainland Thailand. Um, so they were part of the Lanka Sukha Empire that uh, spoke Malay 
and dress uh, Malay and uh, followed Malay customs. And then you have the Samuta from Kelantan all the way up to South Thailand. It's not batik, they are prints, but some people call them batiks as well. And they're used for headdresses, uh, for the men, and shawls for the women. And when you go, sometimes in the marketplace, you can have a full selection of them. Okay. Now, batiks, the last category is batiks by color. So what I've given you is uh, some notes. So when you go out and you see the batiks, if you see these categories, you just put a tick to confirm that you've seen it. And, and you can understand the different categories better. So batik umu. So when I went to Palembang to the museum, they said, oh, ini batik umu, ini batik umu. I said, what on earth is batik umu? These. Made in Pakalangan for the Pakalangan Chinese, but the Malays happened to like it. So many of them were found in a Malay kampongs in Sumatra. And these, beautiful ones. Uh, with, it's all tulis, including the swastika. It's all batik tulis. It's blue and purple in color, or brownish purple. And these, it's batik umu showing durian pattern on the cylinder. And batik ungu, Indo-European. Okay, these were famous, uh, the stories of around the world in 80 days were very popular in those days. And comic books were all over Indonesia and they copied it and made it and the Malays liked it. And you know the, the Muslim uh, tenet about not using uh, figural motifs on uh, your batiks or on, on your household items uh, was not much followed at that time. Uh, you find all kinds of animals and human beings in these batiks. Uh, this is around the world in 80 days. And then you see the Lombok War. Um, uh, it's very interesting because this is a 1930s photo. And this is a photo I just took in Makassar in 2019. And someone was wearing a shirt with the motif of batik, uh, the Lombok War. And what happened in the Lombok War was um, in Bali, the Karangasam Empire, attacked Lombok and conquered part of Lombok. But the Balinese were Hindu and the Lombok Sasak people were Muslim and they didn't like the, the, the domination of the Balinese so they called the, the Dutch to help. So after much struggle, the Dutch uh, forced, killed a lot of the, the Balinese and they forced the palace people to come out. Uh, all the palace people came out and about 80 of the palace uh, royal family killed themselves in front of the Dutch. They didn't want to be shamed by the Dutch people. So it was a very famous war that the Dutch were very proud to win. So the Indo-Dutch people printed it on their batiks and it became popular all over Indonesia, especially with the Malays. The Malays didn't know anything about this war. They just liked the pattern and they liked the heroes. And the Indo-Dutch were wearing it and the Malays saw it and they adopted it. So we found a lot of these. And... Um, it's uh, very interesting because when I was preparing this PowerPoint, somebody came up with this batik and said, would you like it? I said, of course. So I bought it. Uh, it's a Pagi Sore uh, uh, Batik Kalingan of the Lombok War. Um, and then the blue-green uh, color was also much liked in uh, Sumatra. And you have this Safra. It's very interesting that the Malays were very curious about Western style uh, culture and they adopted it in different ways. It means that they used it on their tablecloth, they had the fork and spoon, they looked at the fork and spoon but they ate with their hands. Okay. And this is how it's used. Okay. Quite interesting. And then the orange green. Uh, Batiks of Pakalungan were very popular in Sumatra. These were very popular, orange colors. This is how it was used. And then the multicolor batiks I will go through quickly, also favored in, by the Sumatran Malays. And then we have a new batiks uh, done in Sarawak, the new areas in Malaysia, uh, using traditional patterns. There were no batiks before in Sarawak, and now we have and they can make them into shirts. Uh, and uh, this is Sham Abu Bakar. 
He's using traditional Islamic patterns in a more modern way. And then you have in Jambi, they use batik calligraphy or batik basuret in a more modern way. Um, and they, Ruz Gahara uses it for his uh, household wear and for also uh, modern wear. And uh, Tunku Marina in her pink jambu uses batik tulis. So the modern batiks is also batiks from the Malay world. Uh, but I think when you create batiks from the Malay world, you should not leave your tradition. In batiks like this, I do not see, uh, it's batik technique done by Malaysians, but I do not see any connection with the past. So it's, you know, for a living tradition, it has to connect with the past and have something uh, innovative. So it's uh, tradition and innovation combined together. But when you have something like this, I think it has been cut. Um, and then Bin House in Jakarta, she understands tradition, so she uses traditional patterns with modern techniques. This is the Indian Kanta stitch that she created with, um, with uh, her batik tulis here on silk. And this is also batik, but she stitches it, make it more three-dimensional. And this is batik on gauze, okay? or organza. And also you have contemporary batik paintings. Um, a lot can be uh, produced uh, um, from uh, adopting from the past and using past traditions to create something new. Um, so my conclusion here is, <clears throat> I have to uh, uh, remind you that this is the first time I'm addressing the topic of batiks for the Malay world. Nobody has uh, done this before. So a lot of the things that I postulated needs further research. Yes, um, that's one point. The second point is, if this concept is misunderstood, it can be dangerous. Because what I'm doing here is you're looking at me telling you what the Malays liked <coughs> and what Malay taste is. But this is not a definitive taste because the taste is the taste of fashion which changes every minute and is different in different places. So in the old days, you know, you wouldn't be caught wearing a telo blanga with a sarong on the outside. Now it doesn't matter. It, it changes all the time. In, in the old days, women didn't have to wear tudong. Now most women wear tudong. So fashion changes. There's no fixed uh, fashion. So what I showed you what the Malays like was during a certain period only. You cannot use it to say this is Malay taste. You, you get me? So what I'm trying to say here is I'm showing you what the Malay mindset is. So have you seen what the Malay mindset is? It's amalgamating nature of Malay people. They can adopt different uh, inspirations from different areas. It's the hybridity of the Malay mind. They can uh, have appreciate something from the Dutch, something from the Japanese, and put it together as, as one. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about, that uh, Malays as a whole uh, themselves uh, are not a fixed ethnicity. Every Malay comes from mixed race. Can you tell me one Malay that has, um, you know, no, you know, most Malays, when you ask them, they have a Javanese father or they have a, a, a Chinese mother. It's, it's all mixed. And this is the nature, the mindset of the Malays. Uh, it, it's not a, a, a group of people that can be isolated and they, they, they feel more comfortable when they adopt other cultures and they appreciate it. Uh, it's like um, in, in China as well. Uh, there's no one fixed Chinese fashion. You know, people say, oh, what is Chinese fashion? Oh, the Chong Sam or the Qi Pao. But was that Chinese? That's Manchurian. And now in China, they're against the Qi Pao. They're into Han Fu. Han Fu means the long robes of the Han Dynasty. So you see people on the streets in China wearing these long diaphanous robes. Uh, and they call it the Chinese style, and it changes. 
but you can see the mindset of the Chinese means that they like their mindset is they like to use different traditions in the modern setting. Um, so I'm showing you what the mindset is more than what the taste is. So that when you see this mindset, you can appreciate it. And what else can you see is that this mindset uses the whole of the Malay world, the whole cultural heritage, not just in from one area. So different areas share with each other, different areas make batiks for each other. So it's an interconnected region that is vast. And my third point is, because it's so vast, we can draw from it. And it becomes an inspiration, a bigger inspiration and a, on a wider base that can help us continue this vibrant living culture of the Malay people. Uh, so in my other slide, I want to show you some examples. <clears throat> okay, this is a recent slide of my friend in the middle, Che Su. Um, where, what she's wearing is the Malay mindset I'm talking about. She's wearing a Bugis Baju Bodo with a Malay Tudong Manto from Riau and a Bugis headdress. Very few people have the audacity as she to mix and match like she does. I'm not sure if it flows nicely or elegantly, uh, but it's the Malay mindset. It might not work, but it's acceptable. Okay, then you see this slide. Uh, this is with the dancer Azanin. We went to a party in Singapore. She's dressed in traditional baju Malayu. But if you look at Azanin's background, she's because as a dancer she had to perform in various various countries in the Malay world. She did her research uh, in in Makassar. You know, I went to all these remote places in Luwu, and she said, "Oh, I've been to those places." And she's been to Cambodia. She's danced for the King of Cambodia. She's been to Japan. She's been all over. So she understands the wider aspect of the Malay cultural heritage. So in this dress, she uses a selendang kain lima. But her kain lima is from Cambodia. It's charm from Cambodia. So I'm, I'm saying that because we have this bigger cultural heritage, we can use it and we're still traditional and yet innovative in a subtle and elegant way. And this is what I hope I can inspire and I can show people so that they can use this as a base, do more research on the textiles, not just on uh, Semenunjang um, Malay Peninsula, but the whole of the Malay Empire. And to create even more interesting and uh, dynamic works in batik and in art. Thank you. Yeah, very educational, very informative, very, uh, you know, impressive. John, would you like uh, to share with us uh, the dress that you're wearing uh, in the party and, and tell us about it a bit? Yeah. Okay, um, actually I'm trying to do um, what uh, Azanin is doing, okay? Uh, in, in Malaysia, uh, batiks are homeware. When you go to a wedding, you usually wear songket. It's more uh, respected. But in Java, batiks are worn in the court. Okay. So what I'm trying to do is, um, I'm showing that you can actually use uh, sarong batik as a samping. In, instead of just going uh, always in, in songket. As, as the model here, can you stand up and show people? He's wearing a jambi batik as a samping. And the selendang is a silk sutra uh, selendang, uh, also from Jambi. Okay, so you can dress like this. It's still within the Malay tradition, but it's using a new concept of using batik for uh, important ceremonies. You can wear this for a wedding, for example. Okay, so I'm also wearing batik Jambi. You can see here. This is a this is a basida, and the saro. I have the pachut robong at the back. Um, model is Norman, thank you very much. Okay, can I open the floor uh, for questions and answers? Uh, if you have any, please uh, drop your hand and just click on the microphone. 
Anyone? Please do. You wouldn't think she's Cambodian. It is Malay, but she used a Cambodian Lima. So what would the Cambodian wear? They wear the Sampot and the Malay, the, the Cambodian uh, blouse, which is different from the Sahu Kabaya. And they could wear a Malay Lima. Maybe that makes the Cambodian identity. So give you that for thought. Thank you. <laughs>